My name is Dr. Alexei Petrov. You won't find me in any history books, at least not the ones taught in schools. They'll probably scrub my existence from the records entirely after this whole mess blows over. It's fine by me. I was never much for fame, see? I'm a bioengineer best in the world if I want to get cocky about it. Truth is, I don't think that way. There are thousands of brilliant minds out there. Minds I kill to pick. My talent, the reason they keep me locked up in this underground bunker, is understanding biology like it's a language. Alien biology, human biology, hell, I've sequenced the genome of a particularly stubborn Amazonian fungus. Point is, give me something alive, and I can tell you what makes it tick. A year ago, I was studying cancer cell mutations in a top-secret Seattle lab. Now, I'm humanity's not-so-secret weapon. Let's rewind a bit. Remember those sleek, silvery ships materializing over major cities? Yeah, I bet you do. Caused a whole mess. We dubbed them the Shimmers, not for their appearance. Clever, I know, but for the way they just popped in and out of existence. One second you're sipping your double macchiato on the morning commute, the next those saucer. Shaped monstrosities are blocking out the sun, casting the world into an ominous twilight. The aliens inside weren't what Hollywood prepared us for. No bug eyes, no slimy tendrils. They were disappointingly humanoid, tall, slender. Those big almond-shaped eyes you hear about in abduction stories. The press called them the Ilgari, they never bothered to announce themselves, by the way, which I found particularly rude. We scrambled like headless chickens at first, nukes felt like a drastic step, especially considering those ships just floated there, menacingly silent. Turns out, that was strategic. Those first few months were a game of cat and mouse. They'd flicker into existence. Blast the city center with some energy weapon that superheated everything in a half-mile radius. Then flicker right back out. It was terrifying, demoralizing. Then the broadcast started. See, the Ilgari were also masters of code, not just biology. They hacked every damn satellite, filled our screens and radios with a single message, looped in a dozen languages, surrender or perish. Now, humans... Bless our stubborn hearts, aren't great at the whole surrender thing. Our top military minds went into overdrive while I got dragged from my cancer research and shoved into this reinforced hole in the ground the brass call Project Prometheus. The name made me chuckle, given the whole stealing fire from the gods thing. We sure as hell hoped we could steal something from the Ilgari. Those first few specimens, Jesus. I still get nightmares. The autopsy room was cold, Smelled like antiseptic and alien sweat. It wasn't the physicality that got to me. Yeah, their internal organs were a kaleidoscope of weirdness, but that I could handle. It was their brains massive, convoluted messes of gray matter. They're telepathic, our resident neurologist had said. Voice tight with awe and a good dose of fear. It felt like a death sentence because, well, what can guns do against thought? Then came my breakthrough poking around those oversized brains. Looking for the source of their mental mojo, I found something else. A knot of tissue near the brainstem, dormant and totally unique to their biology. It pulsed with a faint bioluminescence, almost gentle at first. But get it near any sort of electric current. The damn thing lit up like a Christmas tree. We bombarded it with every wavelength possible. And there was a pattern, clear as day. It reacted strongest to a very specific radio frequency. Now, I'm no physicist, but I know the basics. Waves resonate, things oscillate at the same frequency, they amplify each other. I looked at that glowing, pulsating knot, and a truly terrifying thought punched me in the gut, a biological supercharger. The suits and generals were practically salivating. Can we disrupt it, overwhelm their systems? They demanded like that alien biology was some faulty computer code. It's never that easy. But I saw their point. A powerful enough signal, tuned to precisely that frequency, could possibly fry those neural superchargers. It was a long shot, a crazed gamble based on the assumption that this was their source of power. That's the thing about fighting a war against an enigma. You work with scraps of information and a whole lot of desperate hope. 
We need infrastructure, a global network, I said, trying to hide the tremor in my voice. Who was I to unleash something like this? But the faces of those melted cities flashed through my mind. And I knew I didn't have the luxury of a conscience right then. Project Prometheus became a hydra. Satellites got repurposed, broadcasting towers thrum with the energy of a thousand suns. The military called it the Pulse, which lacked my scientific pizzazz but had a certain intimidation factor to it. I spent sleepless nights monitoring the alien ships, desperate for any sign that our gamble was paying off. Then, it came. Not as a glorious explosion, but a flicker. One of those silvery behemoths blinked out of existence midair. A ripple of shock went through Project Prometheus. Had it worked, or was this a fluke? It took days to confirm. Those behemoths, so untouchable, so terrifying, were disappearing, not one by one, but in clusters. The rate of attrition was slow at first, then terrifyingly fast. Chaos reigned. News reports flashing with images of shimmering saucers disintegrating mid-flight. Panic surged through the Ogari ranks. Before, there was strategy in their attacks. Now, their movements were erratic, desperate. They unleashed hell on a few more cities, scorching patches of land as if in blind fury. But for every human death, dozens of their own ships winked out of existence. We felt a brutal satisfaction watching those symbols of our impending doom self-destruct. It's a strange thing, war. It twists the purest intentions, the most brilliant minds into weapons. One year ago, I was searching for a cure. Now, I was a plague maker. And the thrill of that power was a sickly thing lurking in the pit of my stomach. Then the transmissions changed. That arrogant, looping surrender or perish vanished. Replaced by a jumbled, panicked mess of code. Our cryptographers worked round the clock. Faces gaunt and pale under the bunker's harsh fluorescence. It was fragmented, some sort of distress signal, laced with a desperate, keening tone we couldn't fully decipher. I was part of the team tasked with translating this message. And it wasn't just the code that disturbed me. It was the emotion bleeding through it a Animalistic terror. A theory began bubbling in my brain. I requested an immediate live specimen. The military wasn't thrilled. The Ogari were dropping out of the sky like flies, and I was demanding they risk lives to capture one. I pushed back. Understanding was key, a way to ensure this never happened again. They gave in, albeit with grumbling and an armed escort bigger than my entire Seattle lab team. The specimen was strapped to a table that looked more like an Inquisition torture device. It was smaller than the cadavers I'd examine, female, I think. Its eyes, usually calm and eerily intelligent, were wild with the same fear I detected in their coded transmissions. In the moment we hit that brain knot with the pulse of God, the screaming. It wasn't vocal. Their species had lost that a long, long time ago. But it echoed in our minds. A telepathic wail of pure agony. The neurologists went white as sheets. A few even stumbled back, holding their heads as if in physical pain. I shut down the pulse, heart pounding with a mix of disgust and a chilling sort of fascination. We'd found their weakness, all right, but this wasn't a malfunction, not like a computer glitching out. This was overload, the biological equivalent of revving an engine until it literally tears itself apart. The specimen didn't last long. We watched its brain function deteriorate in real time. Every spike of that pulse was like a hammer blow to its overloaded neural circuits. It died within hours, its massive brain irrevocably fried. Now, here's where the moral dilemma gut punches you. Because I realized we weren't just exploiting a weak spot in their biology. We were inflicting torture on a scale previously unimaginable. Imagine your worst migraine. Then amplify it a hundredfold. Then pump it directly into the very core of your consciousness. Every single one of those vanished ships represented a crew experiencing that relentless agony. Before oblivion, was this any different from the horrors they perpetrated on us? The guilt gnawed at me, relentless. There were hushed talks, arguments in the upper echelons. Some pushed for outright extermination, and I for an I mentality, others. A smaller but vocal group argued for de-escalation. It was messy, ugly 
and filled with the kind of fear-fueled decision-making that leads to atrocities on both sides. Turns out, the choice was taken out of our hands. The Ilgari ship stopped vanishing. It was sudden, like a tap abruptly turned off. Then came a new broadcast, one filled not with demands or threats, but a single, desperate word repeated in dozens of Earth languages, ceasefire. The surrender was anticlimactic. Dozens of those shimmers materialized over remote, unpopulated areas. The Ilgari disembarked, looking well, defeated. They'd shed their shimmering armor, wore simple gray robes. The weapons, the technology that made them seem invincible, were obscene. They came not as conquerors, but as refugees. Negotiations were well. Let's just say the UN got a crash course in intergalactic diplomacy. And it wasn't pretty. Turns out, the Ilgari were a dying race. Not from disease or war, but from a slow, irreversible fate in their biological evolution. That supercharged brain knot, the thing that unlocked their telepathy, their technology. Dot dot it was also a time bomb, over millennia. Its energy demands had pushed their neural networks to the brink. Each generation was a little less stable, a little more prone to sudden, catastrophic overload. They weren't here to conquer. They were here to survive. You'd think this revelation would spark compassion. It didn't. Fear's got a way of twisting logic. We saw a weakening predator, and the scavengers started circling. Our military, bolstered by their victory, wanted guarantees, reparations. Earth, ravaged and wounded, thirsted for vengeance, masquerading as justice. It was an echo of all the worst parts of our own history. I was stuck between worlds. The scientists in me saw their desperation, understood the evolutionary corner they painted themselves into. But I couldn't erase the images of those scorched cities, nor the faces of the friends I'd lost in the initial attacks. When the Ilgari hesitantly offered technology, cures to diseases, things that could reshape human society, the response was brutally predictable. What if it's poisoned, another Trojan horse? The breakthrough, if you can call it, that came from an unexpected source. The Ilgari had always focused on telepathic communication. But in those final, chaotic months, with their systems in disarray, they reverted to something primal. Vocalizations, simple grunts, hisses. A language of fear and need. Our AI specialists got to work, turns out, translating emotion is easier than deciphering complex linguistics. Within weeks, we had a crude but usable lexicon. What emerged was a horror story more profound than any alien invasion we'd imagined. The Ilgari homeworld, it wasn't dying. It was dead. Centuries dead. An ecological apocalypse. Not due to war or greed, but a terrifying consequence of their own advancement. That telepathic supercharger didn't just strain their brains. It bled into their environment. Electromagnetic storms, feedback loops that stabilized their planet's very core. they become interstellar nomads desperately seeking a world with the delicate biological balance to host them. A world that wasn't actively being destroyed by the very presence of their species. The problem was, there weren't many of those. Our blue marble, with its resilient biosphere and relatively weak electromagnetic field. It was a damn paradise to them. The revelation slammed into us like a comet. It upended everything. Suddenly, we weren't facing conquerors but refugees fleeing a self-inflicted cataclysm. The guilt of what we'd done, the thousands know, millions we condemned to agonizing extinction. Hit with the force of a revelation. This was some alien scheme. This was a cosmic tragedy where we'd unwittingly played the role of executioners. But here's the thing about plot twists they stack. The Ilgari offered us a way out. Not the cure all we'd first envisioned, with focused study. They claim to have a way to dampen their supercharger's effect, lessen the fatal strain on their bodies and the surrounding environment. It would take time, resources, and a hell of a lot of trust on both sides. The choice was stark, exile, probably dooming them to die out in the cold void of space, or risky. Uneasy collaboration with a species we nearly wiped out. Maybe it's the optimist in me, the part that survived late nights in the lab, and bunkers. But I believe we'll choose the harder path. Coexistence is never easy. 
especially between wounded species. There will be fanatics, extremists who will decry this as bowing to invaders. But if we've learned one damn thing from all this, it's that the universe plays a longer, stranger game than we ever imagined. We're not just fighting for survival anymore. We're fighting to be worthy of it, for ourselves and for those shimmering-eyed aliens who may just hold the key to a future we never dared to dream of. Integration was the word of the era, a concept that seemed simple on hastily drafted treaties and far messier in practice. Earth was awash with the Ilgari, no longer otherworldly monoliths, but fragile figures navigating our chaotic cities. Their presence, a constant reminder of our near genocide, sparked a simmering tension that threatened to boil over at any moment. They helped, that much I'll give them, Elgari scientists joined forces with ours. Their advanced understanding of biology finally aimed at healing rather than destroying. Cancer wards emptied, new energy technologies whispered promises of a cleaner future, and joint teams toiled over the modifications that could save their species from its evolutionary death sentence. Progress, however, was painfully slow. The damage to their neural networks was so deeply ingrained that only incremental changes were possible. Each adjustment, each dampening of those cursed superchargers brought agonizing side effects. Seizures, blackouts, mental breakdowns I witnessed for Stan the Ilgari paying the price for their ancestors. Evolutionary gamble. It deepened the divide some saw their suffering as just punishment, while others were awakened to a chilling empathy. I was firmly in the latter camp. Call me a bleeding heart, but I couldn't erase the memory of that tortured specimen writhing on the table. We'd stop the pulse after its death, content with uneasy deterrence. But the questions that clawed at me in the sleepless hours were far more insidious. What kind of monsters had we become? Were we any different from the Ilgari, whose desperation had led them down a destructive path? We'd weaponized their biology, exploited their deepest vulnerability, Sure, it was for survival. But wasn't that the excuse every tyrant in history had used? My unease grew with every shared analysis session. The Ogari were long-range thinkers, planners across generations. While their immediate crisis was this biological time bomb, their eyes were fixed on a grander scheme. Earth had the resources they desperately needed, the resilient ecosystem their own tinkering had destroyed. We danced around the topic, pretending it was about collaboration, about rebuilding. But I, with my cursed talent for reading between the lines of biology, saw the truth they tried so hard to veil. They weren't just adapting, weren't just aiming for survival. They were evolving towards something new, something uniquely suited to Earth. Call it paranoia fueled by too many late nights and too much coffee. But I was convinced the end goal of their so-called integration wasn't peace. It was colonization of a gentler kind, a biological coup disguised as salvation. I tried voicing my fears. They call me Cassandra, dismiss me as being blinded by past trauma. Maybe they were right. Maybe I'd seen too much darkness to trust in the promises of a scarred and desperate species. But the scientist in me wouldn't let it go. So, I did what any self-sabotaging, probably a little crazy researcher would do. I began my own little side investigation. My access codes got me into places they didn't think I'd look. Late night forays into shared data banks, cross-referencing medical studies with obscure environmental reports. It was a puzzle growing darker with each piece I slotted into place. Then came the day I wish I could forget. Buried deep within an ecological impact analysis was a projected model based on Elgari population integration. At first glance, it seemed positive a predicted stabilization of certain volatile ecosystems. But then I looked closer, digging into the raw data, the algorithms churning out the results. The truth wasn't in what the model showed, but what it deliberately ignored. The cumulative effect of thousands, then millions, of Ilgari living among us. The subtle shifts in our electromagnetic field, the microscopic alterations to our atmosphere. The gradual but undeniable changes that mirrored horrifically mirrored the ecological collapse of their homeworld. The pieces clicked into place with a sickening finality. They weren't just saving themselves. They were terraforming our planet, not with machines and bombs, but with their very presence. 
Their integration, painted as salvation, was extinction by another name ours. And the worst part, it wouldn't be a fiery, cataclysmic end, it would be slow. Disguised as progress, until one day we looked around and realized that the world we knew was gone, replaced by an echo of their fatal paradise.